well, I guess let's go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, but I'm sure most of you do, <laughs> I'm Catherine. Um, I'm the executive director at the Protego Foundation, and I'm super excited to lead this book club today. Um, this is my first time doing so, so bear with me if I mess anything up. Um, Harry Potter is like my first fandom that I had a passion for. So I'm always like super stoked to talk about it. Um, and I've been itching to kind of like ask my own questions and propose my own topics of discussion. <laughs> so yeah, um, I kind of want to start us off with just a little bit of a quote. Um, and if you've reread the whole book, um, you'll know probably where this is coming from. Um, so the quote says, if you want to know what a man's like, take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. And at first glance, I was like, oh, that's a nice sentiment. But then I also realized it could be a little bit speciesist. So um, that kind of also ties into a lot of the themes in this book um, about how we treat our inferiors and who we deem inferior. So I just kind of thought that was a nice little quote to start us off with. So keep that one in mind as we continue talking about the book. Um, so I think the biggest thing that all of us probably keyed into um, when we read this book is that the tasks are heavily um, magical creature oriented. Um, so what we're going to do actually is split this conversation on this book into two uh, separate meetings. So this first meeting, we're going to kind of tackle like all the big things like the tasks in the Triwizard Tournament. And then next month, we're actually going to go into more detail and kind of talk about each individual creature and some of the like other small things in the book that um, can also tie, in, tie into animal rights um, in the books and, and how the creatures are treated. Um, so what are everyone's thoughts on the first task? Um, you know, we've got the dragons who were mothers um, and brought with their eggs um, into this environment um, where a contestant is trying to take their eggs. Um, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And also, what do we think this task tells us about the willingness of wizards to use methods for controlling animals that we wouldn't use with humans, such as bringing their eggs along and, you know, stunning them and putting them to sleep to bring them to the tournament? Um, if anyone wants to start chiming in on that, feel free to take it away. Let's talk about dragons. <laughs> Well, I, whenever I think about the the dragons and the fact that, you know, they're mothers with eggs, I always think about like the dairy industry and, and cows and taking um, babies away from their mothers. And then also seeing it as sort of a, like a hunting sort of way. So it's not just, it's, it's taking these animals, but it's like hunting them. It, it's a sport. It's not, I mean, it's the whole thing is done for a tournament. It's a game to the, you know, to the audience and it's a game to the participants and everything. So it's, um, unnecessary and cruel and, um, yeah, that's initial. I could go more, but that's starting out my <laughs> ideas. Um, I guess what strikes me most about that is, and I agree with what Ali said, but the fact that the eggs that they were supposed to collect were not actually, they were like plants. They weren't actually not plants, but like they had been planted there. Um, and it was kind of like a psychological like warfare on the dragons. Um, and also, I mean, it would have been bad enough if the dragons had just been chained and like used by themselves, but the fact that they were like losing, thought they were losing their babies, like, yeah, I would react and want to attack and defend as well. Um, and I think it also just speaks to this larger, um, like it pits humans against other animals because in the tasks you never really see, I mean, this goes into like the mer people as well, but you see them as like, like every, everybody in nature of, of non-human species are like antagonizing or, um, or trying to fight against the humans who are seen as the protagonists. So I think that's like a recurring theme throughout the series. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Temple Ruff said, I'm always upset by crumb causing the mother to crush some of her eggs. It's a traumatic challenge for the moms. And that's like so completely true. Um, that actually like broke my heart when I read it this time. Cause like that poor mom is like 
trying to protect her babies and and then in doing so she actually ends up you know squashing some of them like uh yeah no that's that's horribly traumatic I guess what I was going to say is in my opinion it's probably the most needlessly cruel of all of the tasks because it is because for almost all of the others it really was just kind of a you had to get past uh like some sort of creature but in this one you actually it was basically positioned as like an adversarial well interaction of no you need to fight the dragon where it's like i think I think almost all of them pretty much went for a like more combat oriented way of getting past uh, to get the egg than for any of the other tasks. And you also, you know, adding into the fact like their mothers and it's just kind of becomes a bit of the and the fact that once the eggs are crushed, just the fact the general attitude everyone has is, oh, yeah, crump or no. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Crumb lost points because of that. And not at all like, yeah, like the dragon also lost its eggs. And what happens to the other like dragon's eggs after? Because I know with like most animals, if they lay eggs that are meant to be like tended, if the mother's not tending them for too long, then like the eggs just don't baby. And it's like, are we like it just sort of in terms of like the trans supporting them is like are they also potentially just abandoning these eggs becoming baby dragons just because like oh like they could be more useful as this rather than making sure that they're actually able to like mom their eggs to make sure that they become little babies that's very true like we don't get any sort of closure on what happens to the dragons and those eggs like after the tournament is over like if they get you know returned to where they're from um that's a really good point um yeah and lydia says um yeah harry also lost points for uh getting injured by the dragon um uh despite his minimal efforts to not harm her so that's actually um an interesting point that we could probably talk about like the different tactics that each uh wizard in the tournament or witch in the tournament decided to use like um i mean did we see harry's as being a sort of confrontational approach or do we think his was actually kind of the more humane approach um to that task he was sort of like like compared to the others he was also like baiting the mother as kind of like hey like abandon your babies come like go, like come leave them whereas like cedric's like at least his initial attempt was probably like the distracting it with hey food uh is was probably the more humane idea where it's just kind of you know because it needs to eat uh from what we can tell is they're carnivores so uh, that would work uh, versus like you kind of just get hey like pull away from your babies long enough for me to snatch it <laughs> yeah <laughs> very true oh and yeah good point Lydia I mean like there's never really any humane way of exploiting animals that is very true um, but yeah like we see uh, in the the lead up to the, the first task um, with like Harry, Ron, Hermione, or mostly Hermione, <laughs> Harry, like trying to figure out with the, the dragons, um, you know, what tactics to use. And a lot of them are, okay, how do we, how do we defeat this dragon? How do we get a spell to go through its scales? Um, like that type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts or comments about the dragon task? Um, something that just kind of always confuses me while I'm reading through this time is just the the terminology that the author uses. Um, and then, so for example, like the horn tail has evil eyes and is monstrous. So she's trying to make the dragon seem like fearsome, which I understand. But then she also writes in this tragic, like it's a mother 
protecting her babies. So the author is aware of that, but then she uses these words <laughs> and it just sends like very confusing signals to me. Um, it's just a random thought that I had. <laughs> yeah. No, actually to piggyback off that, I think even in um, reading those chapters, there were moments where um, the dragons would be referred to as she, but then there were also times when the dragons would be referred to as it, <laughs> um, which as, as we may have discussed before is kind of a way of sort of invalidating the beinghood of creatures by calling them it. Um, so it was just like, in that way, it was also a little bit of kind of dismissing that they are mothers when she would call them it rather than she. Um, yeah, that's really inconsistent throughout the books I've noticed. And I, I, I kind of want to ask her, like, what <laughs> was her thought process there? Or did she just not pay attention to it? Yeah, for sure. And I know, Ali, you said um, that this, you know, kind of brought to mind the, the dairy industry um, and how mother cows are treated. Um, but I was wondering if it brought to mind any other uh, types of entertainment um, where animals are treated in a similar way to anybody? I feel like I've seen in a circus or something video before, like, um, like a mother bear with like her baby bears or something and like them using them, the, the babies to kind of like encourage her to act a certain way or do something. And I think that any kind of, I mean, it's just very manipulative and it's very, you know, it's using them, um, using their, their feelings and their emotions. And, and the fact that, um, the fact that the people who organized the tournament knew that the mother dragon would try to protect, protect her babies and, and specifically use that against her, like use her empathy and used her, um, you know, her feelings of, uh, like nurturing and her sort of, it's the word I'm looking for that. Yeah. That like maternal instinct, I guess, and using that against her specifically, um, is just really, really hard to see. Um, and I think the same thing might, you know, would happen, um, in that, that circus thing. I'm trying to remember where I saw, I avoid any kind of animal <laughs> exploitation videos, but I think it was one of those that got past me. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, just very like manipulative and cruel. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then Lydia uh, said in the chat, um, perhaps bullfighting. Um, yeah, because that with that, it's like the ultimate objective is, you know, they're, they're trying to defeat um, in, in a sentient being. Yeah, and it's like teasing and just like purposely yeah. trying to evoke emotion and basically essentially piss off the bulls and the same thing with the dragons. Um, I see Elizabeth, uh, you have your hand up. That's my mom. Yeah. I was going to say like your mom, but I was like, I'll just say her name. She has a name too, but <laughs> as a mother. Just, yeah, um, like Kaylee, you know, being, I'm a mom as well. And that is the most basic primal instinct is to protect your young. And they're really trying to exploit that. I guess I don't want to say weakness because it's not a weakness. Um, it's a vulnerability. Because if your baby is in danger, you know, hold on. That's where the, the mama bear expression comes from. Um, you can be mama dragon here. Um, but I, I found that surprising that they would, you know, again, uh, use this as a form of measuring the wizards and witches uh, skills and abilities by, by exploiting somebody's vulnerable, the dragon's vulnerability. That's a good point. Maybe it speaks to, I guess, the personalities of the the people in charge of creating the tournament. <laughs> um, well, and as a mom, I really objected to the whole idea of the tournament anyway. <laughs> um, I, I was pleased to see that that the kids at least had to be of age, but still, I would not be sending my kid off to uh, Hogwarts or anywhere and expecting literally death defying activities that is true 
I know they could swoop in in the last moment, but as we all saw, that's not foolproof. We can move on to the the second task. So uh, as we know, the second task involved um, kidnapping, I guess, (laughs) of students um, and putting them into the lake um, in the mermaid's domain. Um, And up until this point, we haven't really seen much about mermaids and their interactions with humans. Um, and so like the, the question I kind of want to use to get us started on this one is, um, you know, how do we think the mermaids feel about their domain being used for human entertainment? Um, because we do notice that, you know, when Harry pulls his wand out, uh, it scares them. So perhaps they might have a fear of magic. So you know, what was this an appropriate thing to ask them to participate in um, on the ministry's part to ask them, oh, hey, do you want to do this? Like, Mm -hmm. um, do you think maybe there was some intimidation factor there? Um, there, There's a lot of things that it could be, but I kind of want to hear all of y'all's opinions. (laughs) The movies, in my opinion, did the mermaids like so like bad on this? Just because like in the books, like there's a whole, like there's a whole bit of like, Harry realizing that, hey, you know, the even the wizard world kind of has that whole like pretty mermaid like idea, even when that's not what mermaids actually are. But beyond that, in the books, you actually are specifically told about Dumbledore or talking to the mermaids in their own language to negotiate the fact this was going to happen versus in the movies, it kind of is just kind of more gives the illusion of it being more similar to the first task where it's like, hey, we know the mermaids live here. So we tied up a bunch of people. So now you need to invade their home. They do not know you're coming. Good luck with that versus them actually having, even if it's not, they don't have like the same level of power in the negotiation. They're at the very least being, we are be told told indirectly that they are at least involved in this negotiation that they are being, that they are sort of, of that somebody is taking the effort to at the very least reach out and communicate to them in their language, in a way that they can understand that this is going to happen. These, these are kind of like, this is the idea here. So even if it's kind of like the bit where, you know, sort of like you showing up at someone's house and like potentially acting much more violently than like, would potentially be reasonable at the very least they're kind of on the same side of knowing that it's coming and Mm -hmm. that they're a part of the conversation instead of it just kind of being oh no look these are also monsters that live in the lake and nobody can speak to them because we're not really establishing that hey that's actually a language that if you wanted people can learn very good point very good point especially when you compare it to the first task (laughs) Like where they didn't really have a choice. <laughs> like the dragons didn't have a choice to, you know, participate. Um, any other thoughts about the second task? Because there was actually, you know, more than just mermaids involved in it as well. Um, we've got the Grindylows, both wild and um, I think there was one chained up outside a mermaid's door <laughs> or something. <laughs> So throughout the whole series so far, and after we've seen non-human animals as property, like food, entertainment, clothing, companions, et cetera. But I think, I think this is the first time that we've seen a reversal of that where humans are property and we're led to believe that this is really unnatural and to view it as I think somebody said before as kidnapping. So that kind of increases the cognitive cognitive dissonance why do characters see themselves human characters see themselves as requiring freedom but no other species that is so true do we think that um like because the mermaids are scared of magic do we think that maybe um i think it was nicole that mentioned you know there was like a like maybe there was a a different level of power than negotiations between the mermaids and the humans but do we think you know, would they have always agreed to do this? Or was there some sort of like feeling that they had to go along with it because they are afraid of magic? I wouldn't be that surprised if they would have done it without the mermaids say so. And just kind of 
done it like movies where it seems like hey we just plopped a bunch of children and now we're sending other children to come and come and attack you to get them back yeah I think that like what Catherine said in the beginning just introducing um book club in general and and Goblet of Fire and, and the quote with you know how we treat our inferiors I think that they don't they just see the mer people as inferior so to them it wouldn't really be that big of a deal saying hey we're doing this and we're going to use your home and we're going to use like your you know people um to scare these um champions that we're going to you know just kind of like forcing that I think that they wouldn't really think twice about it and I I talk about my feelings about Dumbledore a lot and I don't think I don't think he would really think that through very much I don't think he thought a lot of things through um and that's yeah and it's it's interesting and this is kind of related kind of not but um in one of my classes this week that actually um Marsha is in we talked a lot about um we were it was kind of like ocean week I guess and we talked about how um, like going into the ocean there's a lot of fears in that because it's not a place that we inhabit as humans. Um, and so it's just interesting that there's this power dynamic um, in the Black Lake, even though like the humans are still kind of in charge and the wizards are in charge. And you can kind of see that even though it's not a place that um, that we, you know, or wizards usually are in. Like, you know, they have to create the bobblehead or the, yeah, bobblehead charm um, bubblehead whatever it is to um to be able to breathe underwater or like the the shark head or like the gillyweed or whatever so um i think it's only because of magic that the humans the wizards have the upper hand which is another interesting not really creature animal related but just that sort of power dynamic shifted because of magic and the mer people were probably um unable to you know say no because of that so that adds another another layer if that made any sense um, and uh, your mom, Elizabeth, go ahead again. <laughs> just always refer to her as my mom. <laughs> yeah, your mom. I'm like oh, trying to say it. Elizabeth. It's no big deal. Okay. Um, but you're talking about the power dynamic, and um, I don't practice law, but I do have a law degree, and I, you know, I see lawsuits all over the place um, with the treatment of the kids and the animals. You know, in this book in particular. Um, and I thought that there was a very interesting comment about uh, Dumbledore and the agreement with the Mer people, because they really do not have the same power base. So if something bad were to have happened in that particular task, uh, and the parents or whomever would um, sue everybody in sight as we Americans want to do, um, the the underlying agreement with the, the Mer people they, I think I see problems with that because um, they that that the two parties did not come from the same you know equal uh, power stance, and it could have been viewed as coercion for the Mer people to have to agree to this. So I, I thought that, that was a very interesting comment about the the power dynamics. Absolutely, and then the I mean we see that, and we you know might not blame the Mer people, but there might also not be enough rights protecting them it's like you know if you have an animal who a dog who bites you know a, a, a human or something and usually it's the, the human at fault but then there are consequences for the dog you know and it's that kind of like who do we place that blame on like, who was at fault was it the mer people for maybe endangering um or for hurting you know if there was any kind of hurting the champions or is it Dumbledore and the school and whoever the 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 people who made those decisions who should be at fault I mean I think the latter but I don't know if like the the laws you know wizarding legislation like where where the blame would fall for that right any other thoughts on the the mermaids and the (laughs) grindylows in the lake it just bothers me. We talked a little in the very beginning about how Dobby wasn't in the oh, movies yeah. and how he's the one who gave Harry the um, the knowledge of the, the gillyweed, but Neville gets the credit in the movie. And that's annoying because house or elves who live in houses or elves who, yeah, should he should get the credit. And I think that just bothers me. <laughs> like, I'm not really like, deep sense just like it annoys me so 
No, that's actually, that's true. Um, Cause I, I think like, I mean, this is just a comment on like entertainment and in, in movies in general, but like, you know, they're all about the, the human glorification of, you know, the actors that are in them and the characters that are human. Um, so that actually, you know, in translation from book to movie, like I can see how people might be like, well, you know, Neville's human. He's more important in the story, blah, blah, blah. But again, that's a bit of like, you know, speciesism on the writer's part, perhaps, <laughs> um, of the screenplay. Yeah, Nicole, <laughs> the movie definitely did cut out most of that stuff from this book. Um, At least they gave it to Neville and, you know, he needed, he needs a little like glory, I think, and like instead of another <laughs> character who like didn't need anything else, but. It's true. Oh, I think we had a, a comment from uh, Parth earlier. Uh, they always wanted to know what exotic bird Sirius sent to Harry with the letter before he started his fourth year. <laughs> I want to know too. <laughs> Who knew that tropical birds also were enlisted the same way owls are made to carry mail, <laughs> which is like an ongoing topic throughout all of these books is why are they making owls carry mail when they've got magic that could do something different, you know? <laughs> we should but, include that in our next like owl campaign, write something about like free the, the parrots who have to carry oh, yeah, mail yeah. or something. <laughs> but yeah, no, especially like, cause I mean, with a tropical bird, obviously that's a very long distance up to Scotland <laughs> or England or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, any other things we want to talk about with the, the mermaids or shall we move on to the third task? Because there's a lot in that one as well. <laughs> I think, yeah, let's move on to the third task. Um, so yeah, the, the maze or labyrinth or whatever you want to call it. Um, obviously, it's basically just a bunch of obstacles that are creatures, um, at least in terms of what Harry encounters. I think he only encountered one obstacle that was not a creature. Um, the spell where like he walked through and it like flipped the world upside down. Um, so, I mean, what, what do we think about that? That basically the whole idea of the maze was to get past and either in some cases defeat completely these these creatures um in some cases it's getting around them some of them you know they had to stun them to get by them um you know what what do we think about that as the the final task in determining how great of a wizard you are in this tournament i was just thinking about like why is it such a an amazing thing to win this tournament but really all you're doing is defeating creatures like how does that make you the best wizard out of the three competing or out of everyone who wasn't even selected to compete how does just defeating creatures that's really the only thing that you do in this tournament is defeat non-human creatures or non-wizard creatures yeah no that's a that's a really good question um it's like you would think that you know they need more other types of you know, tasks and things to do in order to measure up someone's skill level <laughs> rather than just defeating so-called dark creatures or whatever. Um, any other thoughts on those? For instance, um, I know we've talked about the bog arts before um, when we were discussing uh, Prisoner of Azkaban. Um, so that's actually, you know, Harry has to well, he doesn't have to, but he, in in defeating that creature, he actually killed that creature, um, which is what they're taught to do. Um, like how, how do we feel about, you know, death of a creature being part of one of these tasks? Like, what does it say about the wizarding world um, and their acceptance of, of that? I always blame the adults for things I always go back to like Dumbledore and like the professors and everything and um I know that kids have you know and and they were Harry was like 14 the other um champions were like 17 so I know that they also have their own you know 
ideas and they can say no and all of that. But I think that a lot of it comes down to miseducation and just misrepresentation of um, creatures in the wizarding world. Um, and also, you know, in real, like not real life, muggle life, um, just a lot of things are misrepresented. And there's a lot of, like I said, misinformation just by the government, by um, institutions and all of that. I think that had, you know, the Bogart been, I don't think, for instance, Harry would have been okay with like killing the Sphinx or killing, you know, a, I don't know. I think that it's uh, Bogarts aren't seen. There's also speciesism within the creatures and maybe Bogarts aren't seen as um, they might have the same kind of intelligence as, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of other creatures, but somebody like on their same level, but because they're, and also we don't want to judge worth based on intelligence or capacity for intelligence and all of that. But I think the way that um, Bogarts are seen is even less than other creatures would be. Like Harry wouldn't have killed the dragon, I don't, you know, in the first task um, because they're seen as, you know, more important or better than, you know, a Bogart. But it it was kind of like a, we Bogarts are also dark creatures, which brings up the whole idea of dark versus light creatures. And um, which if Tyler were here, he would be jumping in to talk about <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to talk about Bogarts. Um, like it never crossed Harry's mind to defeat the Sphinx by harming her. Um, so there, it, even within this maze, there is um, a lot of speciesist uh, like indoctrination in, in like, you know, what do we do with each one of these creatures? Like, you know, the, the blast ended scroots, what do we do with it? We hit it on the underbelly with a charm and make sure it like, you know, gets stunned. Um, or with the, the acromantula, the giant spider, um, like, which is surprising to me that I think Haggard was in charge of putting the creatures in the maze. Um, I know we've talked a lot about his supposed love, but also misguided uh, treatment of animals. Um, like how like why was he okay with putting these animals in harm's way in the maze if he knew that you know the the object was to get past them um was it the in this book that haggard said like beautiful creatures i know like in the movie he says that like when they're looking at the dragons when he like takes mm -hmm. harry under the invisibility cloak or i don't know i think i haven't seen the movie in a while but he says like beautiful creatures dragons but like when he says that or in that scene, the dragons are fighting back and they're being, you know, held down and you can tell that they're unhappy and Hagrid is just like marveling at them and saying, wow, they're so strong and they're so imposing and so beautiful, but they're literally trying to break free. And they're, they're saying, you know, people say animals are, you know, voiceless or they, they can't speak, but that's the dragon saying, Hey, <laughs> this isn't cool. I want to be free. You know, where are my eggs and, and all of that. And it's, it's just Hagrid is a very complicated character. Um, yeah. For that reason. Um, any other thoughts on any of the creatures in the maze? Um, for instance, like the Sphinx. How do we think she got there? Did she agree to be there? Was she sort of trafficked in there? Like, um, what do we think about her uh, being included? In, in that setup? I mean, just on that, it's just like in general, the how did the different creatures get into the, the maze is kind of really weird because for instance, with the Acromantula, like nobody knows that they're living in the forest. So like, did he bring a second like family of Acromantula? Like, there to have that or did he secretly take one of his forest ones and so you had like where like where are those from because like officially nobody knows that they live in Scotland so did are people just questioning where that came from uh I think they I think they mentioned somewhere about like having agreements with different uh wizard governments to kind of get some of the uh, foreign creatures there, but mm. you just kind of then have, how, like for some of these creatures, like how do you plan on transporting them? Because some of them are rather 
like it's just kind of with magic transportation there like there are different a ton of different ones but you kind of hit there are limits to how much you can really do like comfortably especially considering all of these creatures also have different diets are used to different environments like temperature wise like this is like you know the sphinx is from like egypt uh scotland is not is very much not egyptian weather at any time of year uh and it's something where so like temperature wise like that can't be comfortable for her plus you have like also like for instance with the busted grants like you kind of have like like they have it during this is Hagrid still needs to figure out what do they eat what if they eat something else that's in that maze like do and it, like because they're quite willing to let the champions kill the other the animals like what if like because there are situations where it seems like the different maze obstacles are allowed to encounter each other or be in places that wouldn't necessarily be expected so then it's kind of a are you effectively just making a big like animal fighting ring and then throwing human children inside of it to make it worse with the goal of human child to get to the middle of the maze that's such a good point like none of those animals are really meant to be in proximity with one another um and i think that i kind of would liken that to like I don't know, those atrocious roadside zoos where they have all these animals put together that are in this completely unnatural environment with, you know, animals that they never would have come across in real life. Um, now that, that, that's such a good point. Um, and even, you know, with the, with the blast ended scroots, um, like there's also the issue of like how they got there in the first place, as in they are, completely new creatures <laughs> um which we we could totally talk about that um because again that's another haggard oops moment <laughs> um so yeah no the let's talk about that for a second um how oh. many how many scroots are in the the maze one just one because there's only one left right exactly <laughs> yeah so Hagrid probably just doesn't even care at this point because they started off with like hundreds of them, right? Mm -hmm. And like every chapter, they're like, oh, now there's only 10 left. And Hagrid just, <laughs> I don't know, it blew yeah. me away. <laughs> there was a big difference between the, the Scroots and the dragons because the dragons had that entourage of humans uh, protecting them. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting it's Charlie that deals with the dragons, right? Not yeah, Bill. Um, but it mentions uh, that Charlie had several burn scars on his arms. Um, so that made me kind of wonder, you know, uh, how, how closely they end up working with dragons on a normal basis. Because uh, I know, you know, that's, that's his job with the ministry. But um, there was obviously much more known about dragons than the Scroots. And the dragons sort of had more protection because there was more knowledge about what they, you know, what they like, what they, how to deal with, you know, how to deal with them to protect them, to keep them living. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Scroots, it was anybody's guess, especially Hagrid's. Yeah, that's very true. They're basically like experimenting in care of magical creatures to see, okay, how do we take care of these animals? <laughs> Thanks. I was just thinking about the breeding of the scroots and how kind of like when we breed dogs, they they really shouldn't, the way that they're bred, they shouldn't exist. For example, like a French bulldog or something, that kind of dog can't exist in nature. It's not meant to exist. I mean, they're the cutest thing in the world. Don't get me wrong. But like the scroots just weren't meant to exist and they would have never existed if somebody hadn't meddled with them and wanted to see what they could come up with. And a lot of genetic variations of creatures that exist in our world are 
you know, like the way that chickens are bred to produce more meat and more eggs than they ever would have in the past. They're just unnatural. They don't, they don't exist in a healthy or happy way. Even rescued chickens that have been saved from factory farms can't survive very long in a loving home and under the best conditions. So scroots were kind of just a terrible, everything about it, the fact that they were bred and then they all killed each other. And then the last one that survived in the maze and I guess still lived after it was stunned probably. It's just very unnatural and unsafe and very exploitive of animals. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. Like, um, I think I've heard the term Franken chicken or something used to describe the, the animals that have been like bred to the point where it's bad for them and it's bad for their health. Um, and I wonder if that's like the same way with the scroots. Like, obviously they, they're like a cross between a, a manticore and a fire crab, I think. Um, but then like, you know, if you don't know what makes them tick and what they need to eat, then that's obviously really bad for them. So they probably shouldn't have been brought in existence in the first place. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that that is very, very similar to um, the human, uh, I guess, breeding programs that that sort of like you know breed animals for certain characteristics whether or not that's you know I, I mean it's usually not a good thing so like yeah no that that's a really good really good observation um any other comments or, or things you want to talk about involving that third task yeah um I was just going to go off of what Mallory was saying it was an interesting point because, you know, when animals are bred, you know, for the purpose of like the only reason these animals are in the world is because, you know, for human consumption or for human um, need, not need, but, you know, because we're going to eat them or we're going to, you know, use them for entertainment or we're going to test on them or we're going to, you know, just exploit them in some way. Um, and it's just interesting because I was talking to someone today about my hermit crabs and they asked like how, like, it, cause I have two boys and a girl and like, they asked if I, if they'd ever had babies and it's really hard to breed hermit crabs. Like it's really hard for them to have, um, to lay eggs or have, um, babies in captivity. So hermit crabs, like kind of opposite from, you know, the blast ended scroots who were bred specifically for this purpose, they're taken out of their environment and then sold in like pet stores. And it just makes me think like these animals that were brought in for the task are either bred for the purpose of, um, you know, for this task or for classes or, or whatever, or they're taken out of their, you know, natural, you know, environment and where they're, where they're from. Um, so those are kind of like the two, I mean, they're equally, shitty <laughs> you know but um it's just interesting to yeah that wasn't really a full comment but thoughts yeah no that's very very true um and then of course like we don't know where these animals are sent to after the tournament <laughs> um i mean partially because you know that's just the way the book was written but um I think it's also a human tendency to kind of not pay much attention to the aftermath of what happens once an animal is, um, you know, utilized for entertainment. Um, yeah, they have like programs like the Beagle Rescue Program for, you know, dogs who are used for um, animal testing and then they're, they're adopted out after and it's like this happy ending sort of thing for these animals who are used. So um, which, you know, they shouldn't have been there in the first place, but I, it does make me wonder if there's some kind of, you know, like Sphinx release program for <laughs> after they're used for, you know, Those um, tournament sanctuary type deal. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. Oh, uh, that Mallory said, yeah, the Beagle Freedom Project. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very true. In, um, in the Fantastic Beasts book for the Sphinx, it only has a few sentences and it just says, for over a thousand years, it has been used by witches and wizards to guard valuables and secret hideaways. 
Mm. And it's usually dangerous only when what it's guarding is threatened. So like, that's all that's written basically about them. So we do know then, um, having just heard that, that they are most likely still falling into that category of creatures that wizards are using for their own purposes um, and that they don't necessarily have their own freedoms um, that they can follow. Yeah. Yeah. And Mallory had a good point saying used and that just, you know, I always relate everything back to language and, you know, saying these animals were, you know, taken, like, no, they were like hunted. They were, you know, captured. They were, you know, we have to assign these negative terms because if we're just talking about um, these animals in these kind of lighthearted words, we're not going to really think about the, the real, you know, like these fish were caught, like, no, they were, they were murdered, you know, they were killed. And we have to like use, um, we have to use that language for, for people to really, cause we become so dissonant if we're not calling it what it is. Mm -hmm. Very true. I know uh, somebody's mom was maybe talking about how as a mother, like they would have been seriously like never, they would have never sent their children to participate in these tasks and things like that. Um, and I was just thinking about how, like, for example, how the, um, the Triwizard Cup was turned into a port key and only one person was overseeing that and obviously turned out to be evil and mistaken identity of whatever stolen identity. But who, who, like, who signed off on just letting one person know one detail about like this big detail about it and like how could such an oversight happen when these children I mean it was already a risky situation and but the fact that one person was undermining all of the the entire task or the entire tournament actually and Fleur got injured Crumb got um possessed or whatever um and then it resulted in someone dying but Harry, Harry could have very easily died. He was injured very badly. And not only that, but it resulted in the most evil wizard of all time coming back to a full strength because there, there weren't any like second checks, like mm -hmm. nobody double checked and kept a, kept tabs on what was happening. It's kind of poorly done. Yeah, I think that's like the running theme of the whole tournament. <laughs> like not a lot of checks, not a lot of thought about oh what could the consequences be like um oh yeah and Nicole mentioned like they didn't let Harry back out when he wanted to um so <laughs> it's just and I mean even for the animals obviously they couldn't back out if they wanted to <laughs> so yeah um yes Allie consent much that's that's an important thing like um you know if the if the wizards got to consent to participate or in Harry's case not then, you know, the animals that were in it should have been able to have that same courtesy. Um, Elizabeth, mother. <laughs> you may call me Elizabeth here. <laughs> uh, the whole, I guess the whole tournament, the whole um, point of, of the, the tournament, although it's not as bad as the Hunger Games, I, I just had the same level of discomfort with the whole concept. Um, and the, the control that the uh, the wizards who were putting all this stuff together had. Uh, obviously they didn't have the same evil intent as Hunger Games, but still, I mean, it's obviously, it's a deadly game. It's mm. the mama dragon, the mama bear and me coming out. They're just, it just does not seem right. Yeah. Um, oh, and Parth had a, a good comment. Um, the magical creatures are seeing the wizarding community the same as wildlife sees us. Um, like magic is the same as uh, guns and torturing materials that are used against animals. Um, and we can see the supremacy of the wizarding community based on fear um, as the same as we see in the muggle world. There's no difference. Very well said. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think for, for me, the takeaway uh, that I kind of thought of from all of these tasks is, you know, they're having children participate in an event where they're basically being told that all of these creatures are 
there for you to get past or defeat. So they're being like indoctrinated that these animals are obstacles. And um, I mean, that's in my mind, that's very problematic as well. I just picture like a group of like wizard activists standing outside, like on the docks during the second task and having like signs like SeaWorld, you know, sort of like, <laughs> like, no, using mer people. And like, I just can like, I feel like if anyone here is good at art, I want to see that. Um, <laughs> that would be like very cool. Submit that tweet at us or I don't know, send it <laughs> to the Protego Instagram because that would be really um, cool to see some some activism fan art. Yeah. Oh, Nicole. I'm I love not that. good at art. So <laughs> Nicole just said, um, also just like watching that task would suck. <laughs> Cause it, like for the second task, you just like stare at the lake and wait for people to like surface <laughs> with the third task. Right. Like they're just, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah that too. It's like, kind of comical. Just everyone goes in and it's like, okay, I'm going to wait. <laughs> now. Cool. It makes it all kind of pointless. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's something that just came to mind, kind of thinking about the Sphinx, even if she wasn't considered uh, on par with wizards or whatever, she's seen as lesser than. I was kind of thinking like it's very uh, reminiscent of colonialism that at least they were taking the resources from, you know, Egypt. They even, I mean, maybe she was loaned by the Egyptian government, but kind of like how the colonial superpowers are just taking what they want for when they need it. The Sphinx proved useful for their task and they just took her and used her, even if they didn't give her any respect or see her as anything but a simple task. Mm, Good point. Yeah, because I think she's the only as far as I know, she's the only creature that is from outside of Europe. Um, One thing that bothers me throughout all these tasks is I think about, you know, we constantly get back to Dumbledore where he set apart from some wizards is the fact that he wants muggles to be seen as, you know, equal. And then also, you know, the term mudblood, he, he's like, I don't like that. I, you don't have to be from a wizarding family to be, legitimate but yet he has no hesitancy to allow the mer people and the scroots and these creatures to be seen as lesser just because they're not human and that that that's really sad to me because to be so progressive in one way to he could do a whole lot to help the young people under his tutelage by teaching them to respect all creatures it can actually help them learn to respect each other so that's one thing that bothers me that he seems to be missing that opportunity well said well said very much so oh thanks for that correction nicole (laughs) um that the acromantula are from borneo um so if it's not from like the the forest acromantula it may be imported from borneo (laughs) um i just want to know like maybe the author just couldn't think of anything creative that didn't involve creatures because (laughs) like what could the tasks be that don't involve having to get past a creature (laughs) you know i mean there there are things she could have thought of (laughs) i'm sure there are yeah (laughs) especially with her imagination but it's like she didn't even try She used up all of her ideas in Sorcerer's Stone for them to like get past Fluffy, like with the chessboard and the like the potions thing. And then she was like, eh, I'm out. So she was like, (laughs) more, more creatures, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of cool. Like, if there were like some tasks that were more like intellectual rather than having to have like powerful spells blasting everywhere, like (laughs) that would have been really neat. And like, I think. (laughs) that's an important part of being a witch or a wizard too is like you know having the mental capacity and intelligence to like use your magic wisely um but this class only taught how to do like one thing (laughs) magical gymnastics i like that (laughs) yeah (laughs) that's what nicole said yeah and i mean it's not it's not a question of like would it be boring for the audience to watch because obviously it can't see into account anyways yeah Mm, yeah that's a good point 
like with the Sphinx, it was sort of an, an intellectual thing. There was the riddle, but nobody saw it. And I was also very shocked that Harry got there because it's Harry Potter. But, um, but yeah, the, I mean, they still used a magical creature for the purpose. Like it could have been, you know, a, a, like the Ravenclaw portrait or whatever that gives a riddle for like the passcode or something. They could have used any other sort of, right? Like any other sort of intellectual thing, but an animal was chosen. I, I do see some intellectual uh, uh, challenges, you know, throughout the, uh, throughout the tournament because some of the tasks in the way they ended up figuring out which spell to use, um, I think also pointed toward their character and their moral standing a bit, you know, um, you know, Harry wasn't out to just stun and overcome each of the animals, you know, tried to work out something that would be a little more compassionate. But in the fact that he stayed down in the lake to make sure that everybody got freed, remember he, he was, you know, Gryffindor was rewarded for that because that showed, that did not strictly adhere to the rules of the competition, but it showed his moral, uh, you know, his moral compass, uh, at least, you know, in that particular regard. Go. So it, it'd be different from a gymnastics competition because that would be, you know, strictly athleticism. And frankly, I would, you know, fall flat on my face, literally, for something like that. But, um, you know, I, I think it does have some intellectual um, challenges. It, again, it, poor Harry. I mean, that wasn't fair. He hadn't learned as many spells, obviously, as the upperclassmen. And so... He, Obviously, he was a huge disadvantage just going into it, but yeah, thank goodness for Hermione. And her oh my gosh, I love to the library. <laughs> I love Mallory's comment about like a potential task idea, like wizarding style fashion show. <laughs> like, but then yeah, they would probably wear fur and feathers. But Allie was like, creature friendly costume contest <laughs> that would be cool. I mean, actually, that that you could probably make some amazing stuff out of magic so yeah, especially with like transfiguration at you know just there at your fingertips you could do some cool stuff to to make yeah. some like outlandish costumes could be cool <laughs> or wizard cooking yeah wizard cooking stuff. vegan i don't know <laughs> uh chili recipe or something like <laughs> or or as lydia says um a task where they have to do the jobs of the elves for a day <laughs> i love it I love it, love it. I think it should just be like, have has anyone played the video games, like the older ones, where you have to use the spells to like move things so you can jump on it so you can get oh, the yeah. item? Yeah, like, like a little an like obstacle that. course, but not yeah. with creatures with like objects and stuff you have like, to, like that. Like levitate something onto something else and yeah, do all that sort of thing. Yeah, there's so much that could have been done, but <laughs> yeah. Or even like, you know, one of the obstacles in the maze that Harry went through was a spell. Like it could have just been all spells, you know, they didn't have to resort to using creatures or animals um, in, in the maze at all. They could have just done really cool stuff like that world flipping upside down spell, <laughs> um, which I suck at trivia, so I don't actually know the name of it. Um, but yeah, no, they're there were, there were a lot of things they could have done in the tournament that um, would have been less cruel um, to, to animals in the wizarding world. So on the whole, do we see the task or like the tournament in a negative or a positive light based on this whole conversation? <laughs> I'm seeing Definitely a thumbs negative. down. I, I would give it a thumbs down too, but. <laughs> when Harry got turned upside down in the maze, he didn't use any magic to get out of that from what I remember. He just had to use like sheer determination to not fall off the earth or something like that. So, I mean, there was nothing magical about that anyway, besides being upside down or feeling upside down. But I was going to say when someone just mentioned, I think Allie mentioned transfiguration and maybe I missed this. Maybe it's been in a different discussion. I have really bad internet and this is my first book club meeting, but when, when transfigurations go poorly the wizards or witches can be stuck as whatever they're transfiguring into from what I remember reading in the book. If they like, 
do they possess any of the characteristics of the um the creatures they're turning into or are they still wizards and just happen to have like appendages that look like animals um i don't know if that's ever been discussed or if anyone knew anything about that but i'm obviously they're wizards but then they're utilizing like for example crumb was a shark and at what point like at what point are you no longer using I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say, but no, 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 that, that, that makes sense. I think maybe we did talk about that a little bit at some point. Um, Cause I, I think we actually talked about before, um, you know, if you're taking an object and transforming it into an animal, does it then become an animal? Um, and I, I think we sort of came around to the idea that maybe if it's something that's been turned into an animal, but was originally human or an object, then it's, not fully like an animal in its own right it's a human or an object that's been transformed to be such but you still would need to like treat it with respect and concern <laughs> um but i don't know ali do you remember any more uh, of that conversation um um i know that we we talked a little bit about transfiguration just with regard to like sentience um when we talked about like the whomping willow and like the ford anglia and um mandrakes and sort of if you transfigure a goblet into, you know, a goose or I forget what, it was not a goose, but like a rat or some, like some creature, like does that animal, are they just kind of an animatronic-y sort of thing or are they, do they like gain sentience or something? But I don't, I don't know that we really touched on um, the think, other. No, I don't think we talked about like human transfiguration into animals, which that's a really good point because actually, that, yeah that does come up in the in the second task um yeah with with crumb transforming into partial shark <laughs> um but I, I feel like in that instance they would still be seen fully as a wizard um who had just like taken on animal characteristics or something like that perhaps i don't know if anyone Oh yeah, <laughs> that that's something that we could talk about too. Because um, Nicole brought up in the chat, uh, Moody and the ferret, which is actually not a ferret; it's Malfoy. Oh yeah, Nicole said um, that one of the takeaways <laughs> that she got is like, oh yeah, let's just um, let's see, take away a lot of people and animals' consent and see how many die. Sounds real fun, which is, I guess, yeah, that's the cynical way of looking at the tournament, basically. <laughs> I mean, that's just like the whole series. Like, there's so much like lack of consent and lack of, you know, any conversation around anything that happens to these people. But um, I just wanted to, I think Mallory was talking about the transfiguration. Didn't Dudley Dursley have to have his pigtail surgically removed? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. That's what I was trying to think. That seemed a bit um, extreme to me, but. Oh, oh, yeah, in terms of, like, human animal transfiguration. Yeah, yeah. And I wonder why that didn't completely go away mm -hmm. over time. And not that he didn't deserve some of that, but um, I mean, surgically removing is all extreme. Well, I think they probably just didn't want to, like, ask a wizard to, to fix it at that point. Yeah. But um, And Marcia said in the chat, um, overall, if you consider the way people um, hierarchically rank animals by importance, um, it may not be so different from the wizard world. Um, if you consider how people easily, you know, kill flies or spiders or mouse running in the house um, or using, you know, blast ended scroots being used to research, they're like, you know, using mice in the, in the human world for research. Um, she says, if you make these comparisons, um, I think it seems less cruel in the in the wizarding world, um, but at the same time, if you consider human behavior regarding animal use cruel, then they're too, uh, then then using magical creatures in the books would be cruel as well. Um, and it's not considering you know the cognizance um, of the magical creatures themselves and their own like sentience and stuff like that. So yeah, no very, very very good thoughts on that. <laughs> and Parth's comment. Uh, thanks, JKR, for, for putting this up so we can discuss um, how 
racist the wizarding community is to other magical species or in other words like they're, they're speciesist mm -hmm. um just like humans in the muggle world are so at least in those respects you know our world is not very different from the wizarding world um yeah on that topic though i think it, it might take us too long to start delving into spoon now so actually why don't we talk about um malfoy as ferret um <laughs> One of the, it's it's only one of the instances in this book actually where um, we kind of see an animal of sorts um, being abused and people thinking it's hilarious. Um, and, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, if Malfoy had just stayed Malfoy and been bounced up and down with a wand like people wouldn't have laughed as much. They've been like, oh my God, you're endangering a child, stop it. Um, but, you know, why do we think that these wizards and witches are okay with, you know, laughing about bouncing a ferret up and down, you know, as opposed to if it was just a, a human child? Um, like any any thoughts on that particular instance? This isn't a fully formed thought, but I think that, people are laughing because he has been transformed into a non-human animal because it's humiliating. And just by nature of that, that's kind of admitting that to be a non-human animal is humiliating because you lack something like intelligence or whatever you might think. So it's like um, just subconsciously confessing that that is how you think of non-human animals. And also just like the fact that it was Malfoy um, makes the audience laugh because we're led to not like him. But like, if that had been any other human, we would have seen that as an atrocious act, even though like the people here probably agree that it was like really wrong. But like reading that for the first time when I was a kid, I was like, haha, Malfoy got his. But then I had to like kind of re-examine why I thought that that was a bad thing in the first place. I, I think you got it like right on the money. Like the thought that, um, like people don't equate the the same worth to an animal who's being um you know bounced up and down with a wand as they would with a with a human and that in it for in itself is a form of you know like speciesist thought um or not taking an animal's thought into account even though we know technically it is a human it, it's malfoy <laughs> and not a ferret but um we also see that you know with the the spiders um, in Moody's class. Um, so yeah, any other any other thoughts on Ferret Malfoy? Um, the spiders in Moody's class we'll talk about next time, right? Oh, or yeah. Yeah, that, for, okay. that's, that's a bigger topic. Yeah, I was like we're we're gonna talk about that, but I yeah yeah cool. For me, I feel like it does the opposite effect. Um, in the movie, not so much because the movie is very different, I feel like, from the book for the, the ferret incident. Um, because I don't think in the movie he's actually bouncing him like on the ground. He's just kind of like levitating him. So it doesn't bother me so much. Um, but in the book, it was so disturbing just the way it was described. Like he was squealing in pain. Um, and I'm envisioning a ferret, not Malfoy. So if it was Malfoy, I might be like, serves you right. But the fact that it's a ferret squealing, now that's what I'm envisioning. And it was like really disturbing for me to read. Um, but I don't remember it disturbing me before when I read it, so. Yeah, and I think the, the descriptions were quite visceral as well. Something like landing on the floor with a smack or something yeah. like that. It was it's just terrible. like, <laughs> why would you put that in there? Um, but yeah, no, it actually, it, it does make you, at least it, in my mind, it makes me feel like, you know, more sorry for him, actually. I was going to say the exact same thing. I, so I had a, a great love of ferrets growing up. I actually had an albino ferret when I was younger. And the very first time I saw and read about the ferret, I was horrified, like Malfoy, probably wouldn't have cared. I didn't like him. Now, obviously, as a grown-up, I would think that was terrible. But the ferret, 
getting bounced up and down horrified me. I didn't think it was funny at all. I guess most people laughed, but I certainly didn't. I didn't think there was anything funny about it at all. It literally was one of the most horrifying moments of the book for me growing up. And again, when I read it just a couple of days ago. Yeah, you were envisioning your Ferris friend, <laughs> right? That's, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that kind of, you know, it can go back to the idea of um, worth and importance in that kind of hierarchy and, and speciesism and where where we place animals in that sort of level of who do we care about and who do we not? Because like if it had been, for instance, a bunch of instead of blast and its groups like ferrets eating each other, like it, we all would be like, Ooh, like that's a little, you know, but also the the difference is we don't see them as or we don't recognize blast and its groups in in the muggle world and so it's kind of different when you place a non-magical creature versus a magical creature um because it's a little bit more um you know it's it's magical it's mystical it's unknown um and that kind of reminds me of i think it was tyler who said once when we were just discussing like why it's important or why these conversations are so interesting to talk about um helping magical creatures is because you know we, when you think about, and I'm probably going to miss, miss quote or not do this right, but he talked about like how we think about bow truckles as these like cute kind of, um, you know, these little woodland sort of creatures and everything um, and wanting to, for instance, protect them, but then people don't really focus much on like stick bugs or on like other kind of insect sort of plant creature things. And just kind of like, so the, the fact that the ferret was, non you know a non-magical creature kind of made us relate to them a little bit more and like not relate to them but like you know like Mallory said you thought about your ferret but then it can also do the same thing and when we can look at like a cute little niffler and like care about them more because they're like these magical creatures so it's it's not always you know one way or the other I think that sometimes the fact that these creatures are magical makes us more inclined to protect them but then when we see an animal that we see in our everyday lives it can also have the same effect. So kind of both ways, I guess. Yeah. And I think my concern with this whole episode is that like, I mean, I'd hope that kids wouldn't take away that it's funny to bounce a ferret up and down, but there's always that possibility that because they're reading this scene in a comedic light, like that's what the author intended, that they might actually if actually. they're young enough they might think that that's funny and not actually like take the context that oh no this is not a good thing <laughs> like I can see that happening for sure yeah yeah and it's also bullying like what mad does and then we later find out that you know obviously mad is not who we think he is at, at the time and he's really a, a bad character and everything but it's a it's an adult doing this to a child to a student and like this isn't a book club about you know, human rights and, you know, parents and, or like adults mistreating children, but we could also, you know, that's another topic of conversation, just the fact that these kids are laughing, but they're also seeing like an adult harming Mm. a child. And it's just, or like when Snape like bullies, like the students in the class and then, you know, the Gryffindors and like Slytherins laugh. And there's just this, there's a lot of like power, power disparities I guess in in the series between humans and animals um and then humans and humans and animals and animals not their fault but within like speciesism so yeah that's definitely been a recurring theme in a lot of the books but especially in this one um doesn't Malfoy end up like bleeding though and stuff I I can't can't remember. remember but I feel like he was like bleeding when he transfigured back and yeah, I just feel like what Moody did was worse than what Buckbeak did. Mm. Um, and right. Buckbeak was sentenced to death for hurting right. Malfoy. But yeah, I don't know. I feel like Moody should have gotten fired for that. <laughs> like <laughs> McGonagall should have reacted a little bit more. Yeah, for sure. No, that's a good point. <laughs> and if it had gotten fired, then Her- Harry and Cedric might not have ended up in that uh, graveyard. Yeah. Hmm. Time for fanfic writing, y'all. <laughs> I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure it's out there. <laughs> Everything is out there. Oh, what a good talk. 
Oh yeah. Gosh, oh, and Nicole uh, wrote some quick comments in the chat. Um, also, ferrets aren't super common. Um, and she didn't know uh, what a ferret was when she first read the book, which is, that's very true. Um, so it's more likely that kids might not realize um, that that wouldn't be something that they could, they should be making a connection with as like, like oh, this is an animal we already know. Um, but yeah. Now that was a, that was a very sad episode, both in terms of, uh, you know, it's like witnessing animal abuse at the same time as child abuse. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can make sure people don't take that away as being comedic. <laughs> All right. Well, wow, that's time for us. Um, wow, this has been a really great discussion, and there are definitely a lot of topics um, that we still have yet to cover with this book. So, um, you know, feel free to, to read it again or, you know, make some, some more notes and thoughts about what you want to talk about next time. Um, and thank you, thank you for being here. Um, so you can learn more about what we do at the Protego Foundation by visiting our website, um, which Valerie is gonna share in the chat section. Um, and you can also uh, join our members group on Facebook. Um, so we can you know, let you know all the inside scoop on you know, what actions we're gonna be taking in, in the animal rights world and how you can help magical creatures. Um, and as a fully volunteer run nonprofit, um, we do rely on donations uh, to run these programs. Um, so if you would like to support us, um, you know, you could do a donation with the number of your favorite book. Like is, is it book one, two, three, all the way up through seven. <laughs> um, and join us next time on Wednesday, April 28th um, at 8 p.m. So we'll be continuing this discussion of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Um, and we hope to see you all back and hopefully we can grab some new faces in here as well. So feel free to share with your friends and ask them to join as well if they have any interest in Harry Potter and or animal rights. Um, yeah. So thank you all for being here.